Today we're going to do an exploration of the West Coast Products Great Elevator. Um, back in um, one of our first lessons, we talked about the different components of the robot, and one of them was an elevator. So we had we showed examples of the elevator we built in 2019 for our robot. Um, the elevator we're going to look at today is a um, is a kit that you can just purchase from West Coast Products. Um, we use this as an example because it's very easy for people to obtain if they want to get the same one. Um, and it has a lot of the same elements that we use in a lot of other parts of the robot and a lot of other mechanisms we yield, build. They have a lot of the same concepts, so we can use this as an example um, to learn about a lot of those concepts and parts and pieces that all go together to make a robot mechanism. Um, the Great Elevator specifically is made by one of the um, vendors for FIRST Robotics. So West Coast Products is a company out of California that started up basically to um, produce FRC parts. Um, and they, um, they partner with VEX to release a lot of different things. Um, this is one of the parts that, uh, one of the kits that only they sell. Um, and it allows teams to very quickly and easily get a working elevator. Um, there are several other elevator kits and different parts you can get to make an elevator um, from different various vendors. They all do roughly the same thing. They just do it in different ways. Um, we're not necessarily saying that this one is better than the other ones or anything. This is just the example we choose to use um, to be able to dive in and kind of see the different working bits. Um, it has easily accessible CAD for us to look at, and we can go through it and kind of see how different parts of it are built and um, why they were designed in a specific way. They have a really nice user guide. So the user guide takes you through a lot of the assembly of exactly how to do it. So that's not what this video is either. So if you want to know how to build it, um, going through this is definitely the right way to, to do it. Um, students on any team going through it, even if you're not building the elevator, reading through this is a good way just to learn um, about how to build things and how things are designed. Um, it's just a really good guide in general. Um, okay, so we know what this is doing, right? So this is basically going to um, allow us to raise an object up and down. We can see it here. It starts really low when we have our intake in this case for this hatch panel, and it's able to raise it pretty high off the ground. Um, so we're able to score it into place. So that's what the elevator's purpose is. Um, the kind of the main components of the elevator, we break it up into what are called stages. Um, so in common terms that are used, different teams may call, call these things slightly different terms. So these are roughly how most teams describe it. The outermost stage is the part that doesn't move. So that's normally called the tower or the base. The stationary part of the elevator, there's different teams can have different names for it. Um, but everything in red over in this picture does not move at all. So it's always going to be attached to the actual robot's frame in some way. And it's not going to raise up and down in relation to the robot. Um, the other parts are both going to be able to move up and down. Um, the part in purple here, this part in the kind of in the middle of this specific elevator, um, we're going to refer to as the first stage. So this is the first moving part of the elevator. Um, and then the second stage or carriage is this green part right here. Um, the carriage is normally whatever is the final moving stage of the elevator. So it's the thing that's going to be able to move, is going to be able to get the highest off the ground, right? It starts pretty close to the ground down here. And it's final orientation all the way up. It can go all the way up to here. The elevator in real life could probably go up a little bit further than this. This is just as far as I have it going up in CAD. Um, so this is normally where you're going to attach whatever your intake is or your scoring mechanism, whatever is going to be like holding the game piece that needs to rise up or whatever needs to move the highest gets attached to the what's called the carriage. And in this specific elevator, it's also the second stage because we have the first stage that moves up and down, or we have a second. So you can have um, more stages. If you needed to go even far, even higher, you could add stages. So in that case, you might have a second stage, you might have a third stage, and then you would have the carriage, um, which is whatever that final moving stage is. Um, the 
in this in the great elevator example this first stage is what's powered directly um it's kind of what's moving directly by the motor and then the second stage is going to get its movement based on the first stage we're going to go over how that works in just a second um but the entire purpose of this again is to get that carriage to some height off the ground so we need to kind of design in how much do each of these things need to move to get to the height we need and maybe you do need another stage to be able to get even higher um, but for this example we're just going to look at our tower stage our first stage and the and the carriage okay so pulling back to the very basics of what's happening here um, the way that the great elevator is constructed is using what's called tube and gusset construction um, so tube is relatively self-explanatory we have these aluminum tubes um, so they have uh, they're hollow in the middle in this case they're rectangular tubes um, you could also have square tube some teams use even round tube these are pretty common um, parts in robots some of them um, from first suppliers you may have holes already drilled in them so you have like a pattern of holes to connect to in the tubes um, others don't same with these lines these are just here to, so you know that you're halfway through the tube or quarter way up the tube so you can like very easily um, mark holes and make things properly so those aren't those aren't on every piece of tube that we use but they're on some of them um, but then for gussets these are flat plates often metal but you can have plastic gussets as well um, and basically their entire job is just to connect um, tubes together or any two parts together really but often tubes so they have all of these they also have holes in them those holes are able to get lined up with the holes that are in the tube or if they don't have holes in the tube already you can like set it all up get it where you want it and you can drill through and put holes in the tube um, and then from there you would fasten the gusset to both of the tubes that it's attaching to or both the parts that it's attaching to um, one of the ways you can fasten it is bolts like we talked about last week um, and so we could go through and you could stick a bolt all the way through this tube through both of these gussets on each side you could have a bolt and a nut and you could tighten it down and while that works that gets relatively heavy that's a lot each of the bolts is steel um, if you have longer ones they get pretty heavy um, they're also relatively expensive compared to the method we're going to talk about in a second uh, and they're just it's just more difficult to do everything has to be aligned right there's a little bit more complicated to run bolts through everything it also takes a lot of time to bolt every single nut and bolt on the robot if you figure you were doing every one of these holes for every one of these gussets all the way up and down that would take a while um, so how we normally attach gussets to tubes and to other parts is with rivets um, and rivets are rather cool so they're fasteners that can that can be installed with only access to one part or to one side of it um, so instead of having to put a nut on the back side holding the nut with a wrench and like turning it and tightening it um, the rivet can just be inserted through one side then you use a um, a rivet tool like this one where it basically grabs the um, end of the rivet this long skinny end of the rivet it grabs really hard and it pulls on it and by doing that it's able to um, pull up this little larger end down here it pulls it up it expands on the back side so you can see it expand right there and then at the very end it pulls it off and it breaks that tip off like you just see in the animation so all you're left with is a nice clean fastener you're left with this part up here on the head of the rivet that's holding everything together and you're left with this part on the back that's sort of just squeezing it all and making those two parts sandwiched together and held really tightly because all that force that you used to have to like break that part of the rivet off is still there holding it all together um, so they're very convenient the biggest advantage like i said is they don't have to you don't have to have access to the back side at all so when you go and put in a rivet into a tube you just put the rivet in and you use that rivet tool to squeeze it and pull it out and now this gusset is attached to this tube and you haven't done anything to the backside, and it's happening like inside of this tube 
Um, and this is by far the most common way that we attach things on our robot. We use rivets basically everywhere. Um, they're super fast. There's a variety of tools. We'll go into that later, but you can have manual tools like this one where you have to squeeze it with your hand. There's also um, pneumatic rivet guns so that we use air power to squeeze it. Um, we also have a battery powered one as well. So there's a variety of ways to do it. They happen really fast. They're really quick, super simple. Um, I didn't put this in the slide, but if you need to take a rivet out, you just have, you have to actually drill it out. So you get a drill bit and you come in and once that's gone, you just drill right through this um, and that will drill out the rivet. Um, and you're left with basically the same size hole as you were before. So in that case, you could put another rivet back into it if you need to. Um, almost all the time, you just use the same size rivet again and it's fine. Um, the rivets expand to take up a little bit of room in here. So even if the hole's not exactly the right size, it'll still most of the time work. We do design to be a pretty specific size um, so that we get a nice tight fit. Um, and nothing's like shifting around, but you do get a little bit of leeway with a lot of rivets, depending on how you pull them and depending on how um, how precise something needs to be. Most of the time, um, you can be a little bit off and they'll fill in any little gaps or anything. Um, they're often often called pop rivets um, because they do make like a popping sound when you actually um, insert them and you break off this long part that's called the mandrel um, is the part that gets ripped off. Um, it's not important to know exactly what all the terms are. It's just important to know what that a rivet exists and that you only have to have access to one side. That's the most important part of the rivet. Um, okay, so we talked about ele or we talked about bearings last week when we were talking about the kit drivetrain, and bearings come up countless times in our robot. We use bearings in basically every mechanism, um, and we'll have bearings in our elevator used in both similar ways to where we used them last week. Um, we don't have any wheels in the elevator this year week, right? There's no, nothing driving on the carpet with the elevator. Um, but our goal is still to reduce friction just like we were doing last week. Um, so we have this inner race in here and we have the outer race. In, um, in many examples, basically for however the bearing needs to work, one side, is going to be stationary and one side's going to be moving. We talked about that last week too. Um, for the elevator, these are actually flipped around. So the stationary race is gonna be the inner race and the outer race is gonna be the part that's rolling. Um, so we can see the different bearings here. There's a whole set of four just in this one corner. All of these blue rings are the outer races of four different bearings. And so the inner race is basically clamped by all these bolts. Um, here's another picture where you can see more of the bearings when it's actually stacked up. And I'm going to pull up the CAD in just a second to show it. Um, but basically, these bearings are allowing everything to roll nicely. So you have these metal, you have these metal tubes kind of sitting next to each other. And if you didn't have bearings, they would just have to slide metal on metal. And we don't really like sliding friction very often. Um, Sometimes there's parts of the robot that can get away with it, but whenever possible, we try to use bearings and get nice rolling elements um, so that our motors don't have to work as hard. Nothing jams. It's always able to like slide up and down very smoothly. Um, rolling friction is definitely what we'd want. Rolling motion is much nicer. Um, so coming over and looking at our SolidWorks model, we can kind of start seeing how this works. Um, so this doesn't have all the colors in it, but you can see that this outer, um, let me get up, Ooh, collapse items. Okay. So this outer stage is the part that doesn't move at all, right? So this, the part that's currently highlighted in blue, everything here is not going to move. Um, I did this relatively quickly. So if some things move that aren't supposed to, forgive me, um, but they're grouped mostly correct. Um, this first stage is partly as part of it that moves and then we have the carriage on the inside and it's going to move the most um i do have it set up in solidworks so that when i move it i'm going to move it like the elevator would actually move so if i slide this up you can see that the carriage moves too um some part of it just don't move perfectly so like that little bit doesn't make sense right now but we'll talk about that later um 
but that's how the elevator would actually move. As we power up this first stage, the carriage is going to move as well, basically like the same amount up. Um, so you can see right here, this wheel, or the, sorry, this bearing is basically acting sort of like a wheel, and it's rolling along this face of this tube. You have two more in here doing the same thing. Are, these are both rolling along this face of this tube, um, and a fourth on this side. So the reason we have so many is we're trying to basically capture all of this so that the stages of the elevator have to stay um, kind of in the line of motion that we want, right? Because you can imagine if this bearing wasn't here, if we just got rid of this and this bolt wasn't here, nothing would be stopping this whole um, this whole inner stage from just being able to like get pulled out the front of the elevator, right? This little bearing right here is the only thing stopping it um, from going forward and coming out. Um, we do this in each of the corners. Uh, this one's missing a bolt, forgive me. Um, but there would be this would look just like this one. There's normally a bolt going through there. Um, so you have four bearing in, four bearings here and here. And then the way the elevator works is you actually do it. Um, you have four bearings again, but up at the top, they're not on the inner stage. They're actually on the base or the frame or the tower rails. Um, and they don't move in relation to the ground. But as this bar is coming across, you can imagine they would all be able to roll still and provide that rolling friction. Right, so one of the key concepts of the elevator is on our larger stages, like this first stage right here, as it's going up, these bearings, the, the first stage um, bearings down here at the bottom, all of these get closer to the bearings up at the top that are staying stationary. Um, so you want this to come as it gets closer and closer and closer, these bearings get closer. And now um, they eventually, if you if it was able to go all the way up, um, they would eventually hit each other or they would hit some of these like gussets and things if you were trying to get, if you're trying to drive up way too far. Um, we intentionally don't let it go um, all the way to the very top. It would get very unstable, just like a, if you have like a cabinet drawer or something, um, depending on the type of it. If you pull it all the way out, sometimes it can like come all the way out, which you don't want. We do the same thing here. We don't want it to be like loose. We want everything to stay straight, nice and vertical, going up and down. Um, and so that's what those bearings allow us to do. Um, they prevent any sort of motion side to side, right? Because we have this bearing here and the one on the other side. And so now this can't move back and forth. This whole thing, this whole inner part can't twist. Um, so no matter basically kind of like wherever we push on this, there's always a bearing that's able to like push back and hold it in place. And that's what we're really trying to do with all of these bearings. Um, it does look a little complicated, but this is, we're getting closer to what our actual robots will look like. And there's a lot of parts in a lot of our robot elements. Um, as we go through and explain them all, um, it should be getting easier to kind of understand similar concepts and patterns to what each of these things is sort of doing. Um, Cause a lot of it, like if you start, you can start looking at it, they all kind of look the same, they're just repeated, right? So like um, this part right here, bearing spacer, some gussets is the same as this part over here, is the same as these two over here. So it's the same type of thing just happening over and over again. And we just use the same concepts um, to build up our larger structure. Okay, um, so the way the great elevator is powered, it uses chain and sprockets. So this is a very common form of power transmission. Um, we talked about belts and pulleys last, last week with the kit of parts drivetrain. Um, chain and sprockets are another option very similar. Um, they have a few things that differentiate them. One, you've probably seen chain and sprockets regularly. Um, so if you've ridden a bike, most bikes have a chain um, and sprocket, motorcycles, um, 
a variety of things, right? There's sometimes, um, I lost my train of thought. Okay, back to most important thing. So chain and sprockets, relatively common. You've seen them on bikes. We use them in robots as well. Um, the specific chain and sprockets we normally use on robots is not the same as what's in a bike for most teams, um, but they look similar enough. So if you've done any work on a bike before, you have a lot of the same concepts. Um, they're able to transfer pretty high loads, so you can have a lot of um, a lot of weight or a lot of force um, being transferred through a chain and sprocket, right? Because the chain itself is made up of steel elements most of the time, so you have this nice metal thing um, compared to a belt, like we were talking about last week, which is um, rubber with fiberglass inside of it. Um, so you're not; it's pretty hard to stretch and to like stretch this apart and break it. It takes a lot of force to snap one of these chains apart. Um, one of the advantages is they're able to actually be, you're able to adjust the length of the chain, unlike a belt where you just buy it and it's a specific length. Um, the chain, we'll, we're gonna talk about here in a second, you're able to actually change its length um, with a few tools and you can set it up to be basically as long as you like within a certain um, number of like lengths, basically certain unit of length. Um, these are the tools we use to work with chain. So we'll have um, a variety of ways to make them shorter and longer and connect them back together. Um, the VEX Pro chain tools are one of the options. A couple different companies sell different chain tools. Andy Mark and Rev Robotics also sell chain tools that kind of do the same things. Um, Vex has a video on how to use the chain tool that we're going to watch really fast. Hey everyone, this is John with Vex Robotics. About. And today, I'm going to show you how to break and reassemble chain using one of our roller chain tools. Roller chain is a common way to transfer motion because it's fairly easy to work with and much more forgiving than timing belts and gears. However, for all its strengths, roller chain can be annoying. For example, you can't just cut roller chain. And master links, which are used to hold the two ends of the chain together, can be difficult to install and remove. New for the 2017-2018 season, VEX now sells two different types of chain tools, one for 25 chain and one for 35 chain. They both function the same, it's just that they're sized a little differently. Let's take a look. First thing I'm going to do is back out the screws enough so that the chain can easily fit inside the slot. One thing I like to do is use a cup screw to help hold the chain in place. This makes it much easier to handle the tool while you're trying to press the pin out. Next, it's time to remove the pin. I do this by turning the pin screw until it is pushed past the roller on the chain. Now, if you plan on reassembling the chain, you need to be careful not to remove the pin completely. If you do this, it's going to make reassembly much harder. I like to leave just enough of the pin in the chain so that I can bend the chain just a little to get it to separate. When I'm ready to reassemble the chain, I just put the two ends of the chain together and insert it into the cup screw side of the chain tool. To make it easier, you can use the pin screw to help hold the chain in place, but don't tighten the screw so much that you start pushing the pin out. Now that I'm ready to reassemble the chain, I start turning the cup screw until it presses the pin back in. The cup is designed so that the pin is properly installed when you bottom out the cup on the side of the chain. You want to make sure you don't over tighten the screw or you'll end up creating a tight spot on the chain. Now your chain is reassembled and ready to go. Hope you found this video useful and check back next time for another Okay, so that's roughly how we, that's the vast, that's the normal way that we'll use um, to connect chain together. So we can choose how many links of the chain we basically need for different applications. Um, and we'll specifically, in another video, we'll eventually, we'll talk about exactly how we design for that certain number of links, right? You can't make it, you can't make chain to just any size because each of these links have a certain um, length. So you can't like make it just like a, third of one of these or something. Um, but we can do, um, we have a couple different calculators that allow us to know exactly how far, how many links a certain number of shafts will be apart, um, depending on what sprockets we're using. Um, so we can design that all together. We don't have to do that with this in the elevator. We'll talk about that in just a second of how we actually connect the chain together here. Um, it's a little bit easier for the great elevator and the elevators that we design as well use the same concept. Um, the chain on the grade elevator is held in place with a chain clamp plate. So this plate right here, 
um, and this bar right here go on the outside of the chain. The chain is modeled in this gray. Um, I thought I had another, I think I have another slide just out of order. Give me one second. Okay, so the chain is modeled in this big loop right here. So we can see we have these nice big loops of chain. Um, so that way as our motor and gearbox, which we'll talk about how these work in a second, when this rotates, it spins the sprocket. And you could imagine that if you were um, spinning the sprocket this way, it was going counterclockwise, this would want to be forced up. Um, and we'd have bolts going through this plate that bolt into here and hold and basically attach this to the chain itself. So as the chain is going up, this first stage has to go up with it. Um, so that's how the elevator starts its motion is by spinning the sprocket and moving and having the first stage basically clamped to the chain and it moves it straight up. Uh, give me one second. Okay. So the elevator chain, this slide got out of order. Um, so the elevator chain in blue here has that elevator clamp plate that we just talked about. And then it also has this red part, um, which is called the turnbuckle. Um, a couple different um, vendors sell one, West Coast Product sells one, Animark sells one. And the nice thing about the turnbuckle is it allows you to change the length of the chain. Um, chain has this kind of a somewhat annoying habit there's all of these little links inside of it, um, all of these little plates inside of it and links going all the way across it. And especially when we have a chain that long, right? When we're looking at, it's a pretty long amount of chain. This is four feet or so, right? This could be whatever length, depending on how long our robot is. Um, it's still a lot of chain. Um, you have it going all the way down one side, all the way up the other. If we unconnected this and, um, spread it all the way out. We can see exactly how long this would actually be. Let's see, so this would be, it's 49 inches from there and it'd be double that. So we basically have about a hundred inches of chain here. Um, so that's a pretty large amount of chain. And if we have each of these, oops, sorry. If we have each of these individual links, you can imagine over time that these might loosen up a little bit. Um, each single one of them will stretch just a small amount, but if you do that times a, if you do that times you know 200 or so, however many links are in this chain, um, it ends up being a reasonable amount of like length of stretch. So kind of like any um, any rope or something, if you pull hard enough on it, it'll eventually stretch a little bit. Um, even though the chain is made of metal, but because there's all those individual connections, it's able to kind of stretch a little bit as well. Um, it's sometimes referred to as creep, where basically this length of chain will just get a little bit longer as it's used. Um, so to deal with that and to make sure that we still have, um, to make sure it's still the right length so it doesn't like wanna slip off of the sprocket. So if the chain ended up getting too long, you can imagine that as it was trying to come over, it might skip off just like your bike chain would come off every once in a while when you're riding around. Um, that same thing can happen here. And so then the robot wouldn't work if the chain slips off. Um, so one of the ways we combat that is what with this turnbuckle. Um, so what this allows us to do is it has basically a bolt in both sides of it. Um, one of them is basically it's designed to be opposite. So normally with a bolt, when you spin it to the right, it tightens. And when you spin it to the left, it loosens. Um, on one side of the turnbuckle, those are flipped. So when you spin it to the left, it tightens, and when you spin it to the right, it loosens. So that when you turn this inside thing, they either both tighten together or they both loosen together. Um, so that way we can basically, we can make the entire chain shorter by just tightening, tightening this turnbuckle. So when you actually mount it, there'd be a little bit of thread showing, there'd be basically a little bit of the bolt showing on each side. And then each of these bolts has a way to mount to the chain itself. Um, so you can see these little holes here. So you would mount the chain um, to these holes. They would undo 
um, a little bit so they would start a little bit loose. And then as time went on, you could tighten them to bring the chain back to the same length that we started with. Um, that gives us the right amount of what's called tension in the chain, basically. Like how hard is it actually pulling on each side? Um, and that keeps it from slipping off the sprocket. It keeps our robot working and that's what we want. Um, the way that we actually power um, this example elevator is with a motor. So this motor over here, oh, it's actually the whole verse planetary. Okay, so just this back part of it um, is a motor. In this case, this is what's called a 775 motor. Um, it's a pretty common motor used in first robotics. Um, it could be a 775 Pro, could be a couple other different types of things. They're all rough, they all look basically the same. Um, and it's attached to a Versa planetary, which is this rectangular portion up at the front here. Um, and so I'm just gonna do a very brief intro to what the Versa planetary is. We'll talk about it a lot more in future design presentations. Um, it's very common. We use it a lot in our initial kind of prototypes and designs, just when we're testing things out, um, because it's very adaptable to a lot of situations. Um, they allow us to, um, it's a gearbox, so similar to the gearboxes we talked about last week with the kit of parts drivetrain, it allows us to get the um, top speed of our motor down to a more usable speed for whatever our mechanism is, whatever we're trying to do. Um, and the trade-off there is we can go slower, but then we're actually able to, um, in the case of the elevator, lift more weight or like produce more force basically um, by having it go slower, but still using um, the same amount of energy. So that's what we are always kind of dealing with a trade-off whenever you're doing gearing. Yes, it's slower, but it's more usable um, in what we're trying to do. Um, Um, okay, so, right, so the Versa Planetary lets us configure it in a variety of different ways to change how many or how much the speed is changing. Um, and we'll talk about how it does that in a later one, but it just know that it's super useful that you can have a bunch of different parts, you can add them together, and you can have a lot of gear reduction or just a little bit of gear reduction but you can kind of keep the same mounting holes and the same output shaft and a lot of the same features, but then you can still change how much it actually changes the motor speed. Um, the other nice thing about a VP is you can attach, VP is short for Versa Planetary. Um, you can attach a variety of different motors. So th there's these different motor attachment plates um, and they will have a, um, the ability to attach to a whole host of motors that we use in FRC. Pretty much almost every motor that we use in FRC, we can do that with, which is great. Um, um, so in this case, we're using the 775 Pro in the example, but almost any motor that we've talked about so far, there's a way to attach it to the Versa Planetary. Um, so again, that allows them to be very, very versatile, and we use them in a host of applications. Uh, okay, um, another part of that gets another component that gets used here is the shaft collar. So this small little black ring that we see right at the end. So it's on the um, what's called the output shaft of the Versa Planetary, right? Just like our motors had an output shaft, our gearbox have output shafts as well. Um, so this is the output shaft here. And this shaft collar um, is one of the ways that we can um, retain things to the shaft. So last week we had retaining rings. I think we had Eclipse too. Um, shaft collars are a pretty common way. You can see in the pictures here, they have this, they have a bolt right here and the other side has the opposite threads in it. Um, so that when you turn this bolt, this inner side, this inside, that's the same shape as the shaft that we're clamping it onto, um, 
gets smaller, so it's able to clamp onto it. And once it's clamped fully, it's not able to slide back and forth. And so that's the real, what's the real important use of the shaft collar is it stops anything from um, moving back and forth and shifting direction. So in this case, it's stopping the sprocket. So this is the cat of the sprocket that we talked about before, it's attached to the chain. Um, so if the shaft collar wasn't here, the sprocket may be able to like slide over to the side and we don't want it to do that. So they have a shaft collar modeled here to stop the sprocket from going sideways. So it keeps them, um, it keeps it perfectly positioned here and it keeps it in line so that the shaft that's up here is in the same position. They actually have another shaft collar over on this side, stopping the sprocket from going the other way. You'd probably put some sort of spacer in here or something to stop it from going um, to the left. There's another shaft collar mounted here. In this case, it's stopping this bearing from going, um, sliding backwards going to the left here um, and the bearing can't go to the right because just like we talked about last week some of the bearings have flanges and in this case this one does so it has this bearing flange it can't go through the hole anymore to the right the shaft collar stopping it from going to the left um, so this bearing is fully constrained into um, the hole inside this plate and it can't slide back and forth, which is what we want in um, most of our applications. Okay, um, the next thing we're gonna look at is that part that's on the other side of the sprocket, which is what's called a shaft coupler. So the shaft coupler allows two shafts to be connected together. Um, so you can see in this photo here, the output shaft of the Versa Planetary goes through the shaft goes through the shaft collar, goes through the sprocket, and goes into the shaft coupler. We have another piece of hex, hex shaft, right? So this is the same size shaft as the output shaft, um, but we want these two things to be connected together so that we can basically connect the motor on one side to the motor on the other side. Um, and we do that with a shaft collar, another piece of shaft, and another shaft collar. Um, basically the shaft collar or the shaft couplers are just really long shaft collars. They all they work on the exact same principle. They have some bolts. They can be tightened down and clamp the shafts together. So you would basically just put the two shafts inside of it and screw down these bolts until they're nice and clamped um, all the way through. Um, okay, so we can see that here with the fully assembled one, you have the shaft collar or the shaft coupler clamping on to the two pieces of shaft. If I make this transparent real fast, you can kind of see, you can see the two pieces of shaft inside of it. And these bolts are what's doing the clamping. Okay. Um, so we talked about how the all right, so works. We've talked about how the first stage is able to move. So when these two motors spin, they're spinning this whole shaft, they're spinning these two sprockets, and this chain is able to start getting um, basically pulled down on this side and pushed up on this side, and that will move this whole assembly up. So this isn't modeled to be able to move right now, but if this was moving, this whole clamp plate and everything would be moving with it. Um, and this would be moving all the way up. And this could go all the way up until um, we got to the sprocket on the other side. So you could extend that all the way up. For the carriage, for the second stage to be able to move, um, it has to be attached somewhere as well, right? We don't just want it attached to this chain, if it was, if we just made some sort of bracket or something and attached it here, then whenever the chain moved, this would only move the same amount, which isn't what we want. We want this to move basically twice as much as this moves, right? So if from here to here is say two inches and from here to here is um, 
four inches, if I move this up one inch, now this is going to have moved two inches from here. So this will be, um, I forgot what I originally said, but that's the important part. Um, this, this inner stage basically moves double than the first stage. So the way we do that in the grade elevator is we use a cable connection, um, which seems a little odd, but it kind of works. So these aren't, the model got a little messed up. You can imagine that all of these should be, um, all the circles should be lined up. They should be what's called concentric. Um, right now, these two aren't because something moved around at some point in the model. Um, but basically, this should be a little bit lower. Um, same with this thread when everything is all the way down. Um, so this cable right here gets attached through this little shaft in a way that um, it gets wrapped around it. So the cable can't move back and forth. So if I want to move this, um, the cable will get pulled on this end um, and get pulled up and around here. So these are basically, you can imagine this is just an attachment point. Um, up at the top, we have another pulley. So there's a pulley here that the cable runs around. Same with down at the bottom. So this cable is basically able to spin around this bottom part very freely. Same with up at the top. And then we have a plate right here. Um, these two plates are actually bolted together and this cable in real life is going to be between them. Um, and so that's going to, just like we clamped the chain, we're going to clamp the cable. And that stops this specific part of the cable from moving, right? So you can imagine that right now, this point on the cable is going to be stationary to this bar. And this bar is bolted to these um, the frame rails, which don't move. So since this bar doesn't move, and these plates don't move, and this part of the cable that's clamped right there don't move, um, when we pull this pulley up, right, because we're able to move this stage and that pulley is attached to it, since this part is stationary, um, coming down here, this part that is also stationary is going to get pulled up with it. Um, so from that, we're able to get that kind of combined motion. So just by moving this first stage, we use that rope in here, and it transfers some of the power um, and moves this up with it. Um, so for every inch that this moves, this inner stage moves up an inch in relation to the um, first stage. And so it moves double in relation to like the ground. So once it's all the way up to the top, this has now moved twice as much as this has from the floor. And it just does that with the rope and cable. OK, um, in the elevators that we've built, we normally do the same thing with a chain. It's the exact same concept. We have um, free spinning sprockets instead of these pulleys. Um, and we clamp the chain in two spots instead of having the cable clamped. Um, but it's the exact same concept. You can just use a couple different things. Other people have used straps before. As long as you can um, have um, two points that aren't moving and that middle stage moving up and down, um, and they, those will change the distance between them. That's how the elevator works. OK, um, I think that's most of what I wanted to cover today. Um, so you can see a lot of the same concepts get used in other places that I didn't highlight. So like we said, there's bearings up here um, that get used just like the bearings last week. We have a hex shaft spinning inside of them. Um, same with like to turn these pulleys. There's a, a couple plates that have bearings mounted. There's a shaft spinning. Um, so as this rope gets pulled, this whole shaft and pulley is able to spin around, and it's doing it on these bearings. Um, 
what else? Ever all of there's a lot of different places where there are gussets that all get riveted to the tubes. Um, these gussets down here are much thicker because they're mounting the motors. So since they have to mount the motors, they use much thicker aluminum down here, so it can't just bend out of the way. Um, so they mount to the tube here, and then you'd have bolts that go up and mount the um, versiplanetary. Um, I think that about covers most everything we wanted to.